we are approaching to our last speech of the day from a very special person who many of us know as a mentor instructor and as the giant who built the Cobra Humanities program, right? But me, <laughs> me and my fellow AP English literature students know her as a person who introduced us to the amazing world of novels, plays, and literature who introduced us to little innocent Catherine Mullen's journey into the world, learning about evilness and betrayal, and Marlowe, these 19th century European explorers, experienced journeying into the heart of darkness under Joseph Conrad's pen. And also, um, two years ago in the summer of my sophomore year, I found myself struggling over a decision of picking which book to read. <laughs> On one side, I had a fictional book, um, obviously a made up story, and on the other side, I had a history book about American Indian history. Which decision would you make? The fiction or the nonfiction? What I reasoned back then was perhaps I would spend more time learning about what actually happened instead of a made up story, right? After all, what can we learn from a story that's made up, that's fake? Think about what decision you would make and if Dr. Irwin's speech would change your mind. <laughs> stories in every single culture. 
But why? Why do humans tell stories? The primary reason is to make sense out of experience. The world that we inhabit can seem chaotic, beyond our control, especially when we have homework to do, right? Um, and beyond our comprehension. As humans, we crave a sense of order. And one of the ways we discern order is through language and language's ability to sort through chaos and identify patterns to create a this sense of order. For example, in a very simple way, being able to put a single word or a name to a problem or experience provides a sense of understanding and relief, even if the problem is terrible. What do I mean here? Say you have a friend, a parent, a grandparent who becomes egregiously sick and they are suffering. You want to know why. A single word, although it will induce sadness, still helps. The answer could be simply the word cancer. You have an answer, don't you? So, language and understanding of this world comes um, with a sense of being able to say there's causes and there are effects. And then as humans, we realize that things happen in chronological order, right? And this is great. These techniques help us process problems and solve them in our lives. But that's usually not really entirely satisfactory. There's still something missing. So I want you to imagine, we're gonna go somewhere, so use your imagination. Go to a hospital's ICU unit. Think of what that's like. I'm sure you've all seen pictures thanks to COVID, right? Um, think about taking your bird's eye view. There lies the patient on a bed and there are all these tubes and needles and the nurses are there and everybody's all bundled up and there's the family. And the patient is dying, but the family is importuning the doctor, pleading with the doctor to try extreme measures, right? Procedures. And we hear the doctor say, yeah, 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 that's going to be futile. At this point, these procedures will not, they cannot work. And yet, according to a Dr. Truog, an ICU specialist who has written on this topic, um, it's really important to the family that the doctor still try. Why? In order for the family to have a narrative, a story that they can live with. The futile efforts in these cases are crucial for closure in the stories the families take with them out of the ICU. The story actually makes some sense of the death. Everything possible was done. It was meant to be. Thus, stories help us psychologically and spiritually, absolutely. And they help us make sense of, I don't know, I'm sorry about hitting all these buttons. Um, <laughs> but they also make sense in matters um, a little less dire than life and death, right? What's cool about stories is that they are inherently shared experiences. And in the sharing, they both create and foster our sense of community. Very broadly speaking, think of epics like The Odyssey or Beowulf. Not many of you took my course, but there you go. Um, those are epics. But we have epics today. How many of you like the Marvel Universe movies? 
Those are epics. And what do those do? They show the distilled value of the cultures that produce them. Um, and more narrowly, friendship, personal connections arise as we go to coffee houses or dorm rooms and talk about the latest hot bestseller or maybe even a humanities and science reading, right? Or well, maybe not. <laughs> Depends. Except my students will do so, right? It's on that discussion you can't get out of. <laughs> right, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but there's another way that we share stories. We share stories with the characters in the books that we read. We're sharing their experience. We are sharing their world. So as a member of either a very large and broad culture or a small group or as individuals, we experience stories as way to, ways to participate in and eventually begin to understand and appreciate other cultures, other time periods, other genders, other age groups. Yeah, try appreciating my age group too. Um, other social classes and other belief and value systems. And we do so not through that sort of arm's length intellectual exercise in which we arrange facts and slot them, which is the job of scientists, economists, historians, right? No, no, no. We do so as a temporary denizen of the world of a story. We're in that world. We're with those characters. So through stories, we experience otherness and otherness not possible in the mundane world we live in. We can be somebody for a while utterly different from the person we believe ourselves to be. And we can sense what it is like then to flee one's city and wander turbulent seas in search of a new home and war torn lands. And I was thinking of the Aeneid, and I'm thinking of what's happening in Ukraine right now. You can begin to see where stories can connect with uh, current events. Um, but we can also see what it's like to wave a wand and fight a duel with a villainous wizard gone wrong, right? Or to be disdained by a very wealthy upper class man and prove his prejudice wrong in the end and marry him and get all his money, there you go. Um, or to go hitchhiking across the galaxy in a universe in which the ultimate answer is 42. <laughs> so, we become a part of an alternative world, and what we gain from these stories, and particularly those that are written in this literature, <laughs> is something that a number of non-literary professions are beginning to value. And what they're beginning to value is what literature, some studies indicate, creates in us, and that is, oh, here's this word, empathy. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Actually, it is. Um, I did some interesting reading for this, for this talk, and boy, was I surprised. You get these writers in these very different fields saying things like, well, reading literature matters because it's, quote, it's like a training course in understanding others. And then there's a cognitive psychologist who says, fiction is the mind's flight simulator. That's kind of cool. Um, and they note that in their research, people who read novels appear to be better than average at reading other people's emotions. In other words, they have higher EQs than non-readers of fiction. Uh, what's EQ? Anybody know? Yeah. Yes, excellent. You guys are good. Um, and indeed, there is some research that begins to suggest a correlation between the reading of literary fiction and, get this, improved social behavior. So, the relationship between reading fiction, especially literary fiction, and empathy development is considered 
real enough despite some controversy because you can't have anything published in journals today that doesn't then get challenged, which is the way it's supposed to work. Um, but it's considered real enough that there are some institutions that have begun to integrate literature studies into their programs. And I'm not talking about the moribund English departments at university. No, there is a medical school in Irvine, California that now makes the study of literature part of their training of doctors. And this is, was especially fun, a recent Harvard Business Review article. You think they really care about literature? Well, here's what they had to say. I quote, if we want better thinkers in the business world, we have to build better readers. And they meant of fiction. So they went on to say, business leaders who read fiction will have the expanded ability to understand and respond to multiple competing viewpoints. And this reading of literary fiction increases, quote, social acuity and sharper ability to comprehend other people's motivations. Reading nonfiction might certainly be valuable for collecting knowledge, but it does little to develop EQ for far more elusive goals. Yeah, go on. That was fun. Um, interesting. So in the business world, you have people beginning to say good business leaders should be reading good novels. Kind of fun. Doctors. And I happen to agree with this. Should read good novels. But how does literary fiction accomplish this creation of empathy, of really understanding and caring about others? The idea is it's through in-depth access to characters' minds and lives not just in a single event or two, but over expanded time periods. We also don't discount these characters and their worlds as simply fake news. Very interesting article in a juried journal did a, a test and they did, I think it had to do with empathy, they gave the same information as an expository piece, as a short story, and as fake news. Empathy went up with the story, was sort of neutral with the expository, and man, it created negativity if <coughs> people were told it was fake news. Interesting. Um, so, but if we know we're reading fiction, we don't discount it as fake news. And we don't ignore those who come across as very different from us in terms of our sense of our social world and our being. They're very different and it's okay. In fact, we're more curious, right? Um, their belief system can be different. Age, gender, all those things can be different and we buy in, even if it's the villain. Think of poor Edmund in King Lear, <laughs> right? Uh, Scientific American says, why read fiction? Why it disrupts readers' expectations, undermining prejudices and stereotypes while exploring and teaching values embedded in social behaviors. I don't expect Scientific American to be rah-rah literature. Look what it's saying. So, does literature have value? Interesting. Yes, of course it does. It augments your vocabulary. All of my students stand up, who've had me, stand up. We're going to do my second favorite word in unison. Are you ready? Take your dignity, just set it aside. Ready, let's go. V-I-C-I-S-S-I-T-U-G-E-S. to new ways to express 
yourself. You can pick it up from reading great books and great authors experiment all the time. You can look at how they're experimenting. It's a wonderful thing. But literature has another type of value. I began with 1841 and Charles Dickens, The Old Curiosity. If you want to know if Little Nell lived, guess what I'm gonna say? No. No, go read the book. <laughs> Gee, or Google it, I, that's what you'll do anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, another type of value, <laughs> since I mentioned the Harvard Business Review. Just before the release of J.K. Rowling's sixth Harry Potter novel, there was a great deal of speculation about which character was going to die. In fact, this was such a question that the publisher's security of the printed books was super tight. Bets were being brought to betting places across Great Britain about who that character would be and who would be responsible. And finally, a copy of the book was stolen before the official <laughs> release, and the thief hoped to sell it to one of the big newspapers and was expecting to get up to 50,000 pounds. I'd say literature has some value, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, the newspaper reported that the book was retrieved. Somebody else found out and it hit the internet, so there you go. Sometimes you just can't win. Anyway, but why all this fall wrong? Why read literature? Why did people do this to Rowling's novel? Well, obviously, the thief did it because he knew readers really cared about these characters. They cared about this, this world of wonder that was created that to them, even though they knew it was fiction, was important. A world they willingly entered into and want to continue to enter into. And that's obviously one of the big reasons to read literature. And Rowling is literature. It's not just to get to know all these other different types of people that's here. It's also to enter into a world of absolutely incredible marvels, of being able to pose questions and what ifs. And what's really best about literature is the intangible wealth it gives us that only not reading can rob you of. I have one more reason to read literature. Yeah, duh, it's fun. 